everyone. I'm Susan Koshi, Director of the Unit for Criticism and Interpretive Theory, and I'd like to welcome you to the next lecture of the Modern Critical Theory Lecture Series on Postcolonial Theory with Professor Jenny Sharp. Since the strange modes of connectivity we inhabit on this Zoom plat platform make it impossible for us to see the audience, I wanted to find a way to convey the extraordinary linkages generated by this talk. We have almost 180 people registered for this event from over 36 universities and five countries across the world. I have included the list of universities and countries of attendees in the chat as a way of making what the technology hides visible and welcoming those of you who are making the extra effort of joining us from many different time zones. Hosting this event through the Unit for Criticism here at Urbana-Champaign is especially meaningful because this event continues a long tradition of our engagement with postcolonial theory, starting with Gayathri Spivak's presentation of her famous Candace Abolton Speak essay here at the Marxism and Interpretation of Culture Conference, and continuing through the many later publications in the field that grew out of our events, including Postcolonial Studies and Beyond, Between Subalternity and Indigeneity, and the forthcoming Colonial Racial Capitalism. But more than anything, this gathering, virtual, dispersed, yet kinetic, offers eloquent testimony to the power and reach of postcolonial theory and the extraordinary importance of Jenny Sharp's work as one of the major figures in the field over several decades. Before I introduce Professor Sharp, I just quickly want to run through the format for this lecture. The lecture will be divided into two segments of roughly 25 to 30 minutes each, and we'll have a Q&A after each segment. And we'll be running the Q&A through the tab at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question that you want to ask, Click on the tab, enter it in there, and then we'll take it during those sessions. So feel free to enter in your question at any time, but it will be answered during the two um, Q&A sessions that we're setting aside midway uh, through the lecture and then at the very end. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to introduce Jenny Sharp, whose work opened up the possibilities of post-colonial theory to many of us who work in the field today. She is Professor of English, Gender Studies and Comparative Literature at UCLA, and has published widely on globalization, postcolonial studies, diaspora, and gendered subjectivities in the global South. She is the author of the much cited Allegories of Empire, the figure of woman in the uh, colonial text, which came out through Minnesota in 1993, which provides historically grounded readings of how representations of interracial rape in Anglo-Indian fiction helped manage a crisis in British colonial authority. Her book has been widely reviewed and is considered a classic in post-colonial studies. Her second book, Ghosts of Slavery, a literary archeology span of black women's lives, um, published in 2002, challenges the equation of subaltern agency with resistance and self-determination, and introduces alternative ways to examine Black women's negotiations for power within the constraints of slavery. Her more recent book, which came out this year, Immaterial Archives, an African Diaspora Poetics of Loss, explores the intangible phenomena of affects, spirits, and dreams that Afro-Caribbean artists and writers introduce into colonial archives for breaking the categories of archival knowledge and their accompanying notions of the human. Um, um, I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you who have joined us for this event and to extend a very, very warm welcome to Professor Jenny Sharp, who will now take over from me. Okay, thank you so much for that very warm introduction. And my face is red because the sun is streaming in 
uh, through my window. We've just had a summer, a sudden heat wave in the fall, and um, I'm hoping it'll pass. But uh, perhaps my face is also red because uh, I am excited to be here, <laughs> invited by the unit, uh, even if virtually. Uh, because, and I will sort of just talk about later why this particular unit in criticism and interpretive theory is so important to me. But the last time I was actually on physically on the campus was in 1990 for the Cultural Studies Now and in the Future Conference, which was fantastic, like every event that uh, Susan named that they have sponsored. That was pr actually prior to the World Wide Web that now allows us to meet in cyberspace during these strange and unprecedented times. One of its benefits, however, is that two of my former students, now faculty at USC and UT Austin, are able to join the audience. So I want to use the occasion to congratulate Nitu Khanna for the publication of Visceral Logics of Decolonization and Samantha Pinto for her book, Infamous Bodies, Early Black Women, Celebrity, and the Afterlife of Rights, both published this year by Duke University Press. And I raise my glass in a virtual toast for all the new generations of postcolonial scholars, and maybe this will help with the sunlight. When Susan requested that I give this webinar, I asked myself the question of how postcolonial theory might speak to the current moment in time and seeing Black Lives Matter affirm the humanity of all Black people in response to a nation state that fails to recognize Black personhood, coupled with its dehumanization of undocumented workers and asylum seekers from the global South, I decided to focus my talk on the engagement of post-colonial theory with Western humanism. I begin with Edward Said's notion of a worldly secular humanism move on to Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak's critique of both liberal humanism and French post-structural anti-humanism, and conclude with Sylvia Winter's discussion of the over-representation of man and how we might rethink the fullness of human ontologies. These are the readings I have assigned. Along the way, I will reference writers and intellectuals who are addressing the same questions at an earlier socially explosive moment in time, which is decolonization and the emergence of post-colonial nations. I also wanted to use this occasion to reflect on post-colonial theory's gift to us by looking back on its formation in the early 80s, when I was beginning my graduate studies in comparative literature at UT Austin. Those were heady times when we started a reading group around Edward Said's Orientalism because the field of post-colonial studies did not exist, at least not by that name. Post-colonial studies subsequently rode the wave of post-structural theory and cultural studies that were radically changing academic disciplines, particularly anthropology, area studies, history, art history, and literary studies. I recall attending a lecture by Said in which he described the complicity of the discipline of anthropology with colonialism. During the Q&A, one by one, anthropology faculty stood up to condemn a literary critic, having the temerity to criticize their discipline. While we, the graduate students from anthropology, area studies, and literary studies, clapped and cheered to every single one of Said's responses. Looking back on a time when certain statements were much more controversial than they would appear today, I would define post-colonial theory's gift as providing the critical tools to uncover the structures of power informing Western forms of representation and disciplinary knowledge, to read the colonial archives for subaltern groups and subaltern knowledge, and thirdly, to foreground the place of the intellectual in these critical enterprises. These methodological tools have spread to a wide range of fields and disciplines, so wide that their origins in post-colonial studies sometimes are forgotten. And now I'm going to um, share my screen with you in order to um, present a slideshow. So let me go there and, whoops, that's not what I wanted. Okay. There is no single way to introduce post-colonial theory 
but most genealogies begin with Said's highly influential Orientalism, which was published in 1978 and is now considered a founding text. It laid the groundwork for what came to be known as colonial discourse analysis, which is a reading practice that exposes the colonial power relations informing even the most benign and presumably apolitical cultural forms, particularly literature and art. This is evident in the book's cover image of Jerome, the snake charmer, a late 19th century French painting that denigrates Islam through the homoerotic image of a naked boy standing on a prayer rug outside a mosque, entertaining a group of swarthy tribal men with the leader's advanced age suggesting the decadence and decline of Arab influence and culture. It's not their gaze onto the naked body of the boy, but that of, of, of us, the viewers, for whom the fantasy is being staged. My reading of Jerome's painting is from Linda Nachman's The Imaginary Orient, which brilliantly introduced Said's Orientalism into art history. I did not have you read Orientalism because its arguments are widely known. I did, however, provide its entry in post-colonial studies, the key concepts, which is I signed for the recommended readings, and I have its most salient points on the slide for your reference, underlying are the key phr phrases of Said's Foucaultian methodology that links disciplinary knowledge to the exercise of power. I also want to draw your attention to the last section of his book called The Latest Phase, which describes how an Orientalist worldview and a worlding of the Islamic Arab world continues to inform US foreign policy. Said reiterates the connection between past and present in the preface to the 25th anniversary edition, uh, which I provided at the bottom of the slide. I mention this because critics of post-colonial theory interpret the post to mean that colonialism has ended, which is a presupposition I have rarely found in the theorists themselves. In terms of establishing the relationship of a colonial past to a post-colonial present at the time of Orientalism's uh, original publication date, we need to consider that Said was simultaneously writing the question of Palestine, but Beacon Press and Pantheon Books rejected the manuscript for being too controversial. It was eventually picked up by Time Books and published the following year. The passage I've provided describes the contribution of Orientalist stereotypes to the dehumanization of Palestinians. In saying how this perspective dehumanizes us, Said invokes a strategic move belonging to a literature of decolonization that was intimately connected to anti-colonial liberation struggles. The writings of thinkers like Franz Fanon, Emi Césaire, and Ngugi Wa Thiongo, Sila James, Amical Cabral. For this and other statements of solidarity with Palestinians living in the occupied territories of Israel, Said was labeled a terrorist. These lines from the preface of Orientalism desc uh, describes humanism as the final resistance to dehumanization, which is also present in the work of the Marxists writing on the cusp of decolonization with one major difference. You see before you the original covers of the English editions of Fanon's most famous works. You may be less familiar with the one in the middle, which is a collection of journalistic essays written between 1952 and 1961 that were published posthumously. They were written for El Mujahid, meaning the Holy Warrior, which was the official newspaper of the FLN, the Algerian National Liberation Front, during the Algerian struggle for independence that was achieved in 1962, only a few months after Fanon died at the early age of 36. In the quote I've provided from First Truths on the Colonial Problems, written in 1958, Fanon calls for a new humanism as the basis for a history of man. This new humanism is being written by the action of subaltern groups and is presented here in the image of their refusal to play the subservient roles written for them. I like Fanon's phrasing because it explicitly identifies human agency in the colonies as disturbing the fixity of Western representations, a fixity that Said identifies in his book. Said's own words from the new preface to Orientalism suggest Fanon's new humanism 
in the underlying sentences, which I didn't underline, this is the library copy, so obviously somebody thought it was important, um, alluding to human agency, which is not very Foucaultian, since Foucault's anti-essentialism posits subjectless discursive practices. Said's nod to Fanon frames the post-enlightenment ideals of secular humanism with the worldliness of the, quote, slow working together of cultures that overlap, borrow from each other, and live together, end of quote. Said expresses a faith in the rational interpretive skills of a humanistic education, the democratic ideals of post-enlightenment thought, and faith in cross-cultural interpretations. Can Fanon's call for a new anti-racist humanism be reconciled with Said's worldly secular humanism? I would answer by saying only we follow the suggestion of subaltern study scholar Dipesh Chakravorty that we provincialize Europe. In provincializing Europe, Chakravorty calls on us to treat the universal claims of secular humanism as local rather than rejecting them outright. One of the objectives of today's lecture is to follow Chakraborty's project of provincializing Europe, not through a rejection of European thought, whether it be post-enlightenment ideals or the theories that inform post-colonial studies, but by exploring how they might be renewed from and for the margins. Prior to the recent recovery of hidden women like Suzanne Césaire, the literature of decolonization that informed post-colonial studies was primarily male. Spivak is a major post-colonial feminist theorist and the only woman and literary scholar among a group of South Asian Marxist historians who call themselves the Subaltern Studies Collective, which is discussed in key concepts, but I will provide a brief summary here as well. And this summary, uh, as well as my, my discussion of Gramsci's uh, notion of subaltern that I will be giving in a little while, are both in the introduction of my Allegories of Empire. Members read British colonialist and Indian nationalist texts against the grain in order to find a place for the unrepresented subjects of history. The absence of an intellectual understanding of peasants acting on their own prompted the collective to define its projects in the humanist terms of representing a subaltern consciousness. Ranajit Guha, a founding member of the collective, explains that the term subaltern does not identify a unified and homogeneous group but those who stand in opposition to elite classes. This means that the same social group can be either elite or subaltern, depending on how it aligns itself with any single historical situation. And now I quote from Guha, an ambiguity which is up to the historian to sort out on the basis of a close and judicious reading of his evidence. And this uh, sentence is very important to um, Gayatri's um, intervention in Can the Subaltern, Subaltern Speak? And I hope you'll see why once I explain uh, her essay. Can the Subaltern Speak was Spivak's feminist intervention into the Subaltern Studies project of writing South Asian history from below. She demonstrates the difficulty of a historical recovery of Subaltern women's consciousness due to an absence of evidence in the histor historical records. Ritu uh, Bela from the recommended reading calls it a formative text of post-colonial studies and I would tend to agree. Spivak's essay, as uh, Susan informed you, first appeared in Marxism and the Interpretation of Culture, which was a collection of papers given at, this, at the conference here uh, and, and sponsored by the Unified Criticism and Interpretive Theory in 1983. It was the summer after my first year as a graduate student, and I was fortunate, fortunate to have attended the seminars that preceded the conference, because I can truly say it was the summer that changed my life. Being a first generation college student and a woman of color who was alienated from the university, I was ready to drop out of the PhD program, but I did not. And the rest, as they say, is history, since I proceeded to write my dissertation under Spivak's directorship. Can the Subaltern Speak addresses the imperial frame to liberal humanism in the human making project of colonialism that instituted a race gendered hierarchy in the colonies. So that creates the by now familiar sentence, white men are saving brown women from brown men to capture the strategic placement of women in the linking of humanist ideals 
with the colonialist introduction of a civil society. Her critics took a phrasing of the subaltern cannot speak to be a definitive statement rather than an interrogation of the academic effort to give the gendered subaltern a voice. I have assigned the version uh, from a critique of postcolonial reason toward a history of the vanishing present where Spivak addresses her critics. So here I'm sort of showing a little bit of the behind the scenes look at her, her theory and how it came into being because I actually saw her first teach it in a class in, in a seminar at Cornell. Um, and then she gave it several times and each time it developed a little bit more. So it was kind of interesting seeing it coming into being. Um, she implicitly takes issue with Said's use of Marx's statement in the 18th Brumaire. They cannot represent themselves, they must be represented as symbolic of the Western command over the Orient and which serves as an epigraph for Orientalism. Instead of criticizing Said explicitly on mentioning him by name in footnote, footnote 37, with, um, no, sorry, 27 that I've put on the, um, on the slide, where she says, many hasty readers think Mark, Marx is advancing this as his own opinion about all peasantry, where he's actually lamenting. It's sort of ironic. He's lamenting uh, what happened in uh, France in the same way that Spivak was lamenting the uh, kind of failure of the subaltern to be read and heard. And I guess they both are taken as prescriptive statements. Um, she sees it though, rather than mentioning Said by name, she sees it as an occasion to return to Marx in the original language, which Said himself quotes. And you can see that's in, on the paragraph to the um, right at the bottom, he quotes it in the German, where she unpacks the difference between the two different words for representation which, which do not exist in the English, therefore allowing for slippages between the two. She proceeds to make her argument about the representative function of subaltern women's voice by distinguishing representation as speaking for betreifen from representation or trope or figure, jashten, the latter being the exteriority of representation side describes right before he quotes Marx as style, figures of speech, setting, narrative devices, historical and social circumstances. Um, so there is that slippage actually that takes place in Said's um, English, the two different kinds of representation. Spivak frames her reading of the colonial records with a conversation between Foucault and Deleuze in which they say that with regard to oppressed groups, quote, and this is I, I'm not sure it's Foucault or, or Deleuze, but from the conversation, there is no more representation, there's nothing but action. Arguing that the subject of knowledge does not disappear simply because intellectuals will it away, she takes them to task for promoting uh, particular concrete experiences as a critical move that allows those experiences to serve a representative function. A particular concern to Spivak is the failure of French intellectuals to account for third world people in their sweeping declaration, despite France being a major colonial power. And in fact, the term civilizing mission is from the French mission civilisatrice. She argues that their anti-humanist position elides rather than escapes this colonial history. She also asserts that on the other side of the colonial divide, the subaltern studies historians do not abdicate their intellectual responsibility. And you can see that in that quotation I gave from, uh, from Guha. In posing the question, can the subaltern speak? Spivak is asking whether clearing a space for them to speak guarantees that they will. The danger of Freud's discourse to which he alludes in the first paragraph was his effort to give the hysteric a voice. In other words, if a woman's subaltern status indicates disenfranchisement and even being unfree, is she free to speak? But for Spivak, the problem goes even deeper. What language is available to subaltern women to know and speak their oppression? She stages this problem in the manipulation of the Hindu widow's will at a specific moment in time, which was the 1829 British effort to abolish sati a religious practice in which a widow was burned on her deceased husband's funeral pyre. 
In exploring the repressed history to the sentence she has created, white men are saving brown women from brown men, Spivak uncovers a double origin, the British abolition of sati and the Hindu interpretation of its sacred text, the Rig Veda and the Dhamma Shastra. In a related essay, The Rani of Sirmu, she shows the epistemic violence of the British forcing of the four-part system of Sanskritic law to conform to the binarism of Western law in the interpretations of Hindu sacred texts for the purpose of abolishing sati. Her reading reveals that a universalization of Western epistemologies is achieved less through the negation of non-Western cultures than forcing epistemic conformity, which is why she calls it an act of violence. As yet another instance of the epistemic violence of a colonial worlding of their world, this is a phrase that she uses for what's going on in the colonies, in uh, the British colonies in, uh, in India at this time, the second paragraph describes how the word sati, meaning good wife, is conflated with self-immolation through the sanctioned ignorance of the colonial officials who discursively restrict a Hindu, Hindu woman's choices in the name of endowing her with a free will. This discursive move constructs her as object, namely a woman who is being forced against her will. So when she's talking about the kind of shuddering between subject constitution and ob object formation, the object formation is uh, within the British colonizing discourse. The subject constitution is within the Hindu patriarchal discourse. <clears throat> the colonial official, official who dissuades the Sati, now the widow's proper name, defeats a barbaric practice by demonstrating her enlightened choice of freedom. On the other side of the colonial divide, the Hindu patriarchy that demands of her the heroic act of self-sacrifice, granting her agency and subjecthood, offers a freedom that transcends her physical body. Spivak asks, where is the woman's voice in these two positions of freedom? Her response is in the final line of the paragraph. Woman disappears not into nothingness, but into a violent shuttling between two discursive formations, Hindu patriarchy and British imperialism, tradition and modernization. And Hindu tradition was actually being constituted and consolidated at this time. So it's not as if it is something that is being recovered that's there, you know, and being recovered. It is actually being produced um, as in response to the colonial efforts to define it as barbaric. So um, it is sort of a, a modern formation of tradition in some ways. Um, Spivak uses the word figure because she wants us to gain a literary competence that will allow us to decipher colonial and patriarchal forms of representation. In later works, she talks about the absence of any discussion of what happened to the widow whom colonial officials managed to dissuade, how a condition was a living death, which was not a state of bondage that interested the colonizers, and as a result is absent from the archives. So this is the most famous part that most people talk about in, in the essay, which is really the postscript. So the essay's pro postscript concerns the mystery surrounding the suicide of Spivak's maternal aunt Bhuva Naswari, who was involved in the armed struggle for Indian independence. She knows Spivak, knows the story due to her aunt leaving a record in the form of a letter to her elder sister, Spivak's mother. So this is an archive of a sorts, in which she explains that she took her own life because she found herself unable to perform a political assassination. Uh, Bhuva Naswari made sure she was menstruating when she hanged herself so that no one would think she was pregnant which was a common reason for unmarried women to commit suicide. Despite her signage through an act that Spivak interprets as rewriting, quote, the social text of Sati suicide in an interventionist way, end of quote, namely through an assertion of her political agency, the family assumes she took her own life due to an illicit affair. Spivak says, the subaltern as female cannot be heard or read before declaring the subaltern cannot speak. And um, so there is that doubleness there, but most critics uh, seized on the second part. 
And her first essay, actually the first version of this essay, which appeared in Marxism and Interpretation of Culture, ends with the female intellectual as intellectual has a circumscribed task, which she must not disown with a flourish. Now the new revised version ends with the, uh, the second passage that is up there. In the revised version of the essay that I had you read, Spivak adds that it was an inadvisable remark. She also emphasizes the continued silencing of Bhubad Niswari by sub subsequent generations of women in her family who consider themselves anti-imperialists in the embrace of Indian culture, but who participate in what she calls the new empire. They are the proxies that speak for subaltern women, thereby muting them even further. Spivak's subsequent writings following, um, I, Following this, uh, can, the essay, Can the Subaltern Speak, identified the complicity of diasporic South Asians with a corporate globalization that maintains subaltern women in a position of subalternity. So I'm going to stop there because we're going to do some Q&A so, um, and return to Susan, who will be uh, fielding the questions for me. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. It says you can't stop. Oh, the stop is, uh, the host has stopped my video. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the host has asked you to stop your video. It's not letting no, me stop. I mean, <laughs> let me just, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> do, do, can you start now? Let me try. Yes, now I can. <laughs> All right. Because I think <laughs> yeah, you I want know. to be uh, off the screen. So I, I, I know. I know. Thank you. I'm so glad okay. you did because I, I, <laughs> I didn't have to fumble around as much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, um, um, I invite all of you to kind of ask your questions through the Q and A. Um, and it might take a little while. Um, if you just click on the tab and enter in your questions, um, we can begin. Um, Jenny can then begin to respond. Yeah, and I'm just saying hi to people that I... <laughs> <laughs> I can't see anyone, so I'm going to have to use the chat to... Hey, okay, there I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and while we're waiting for the questions. Right, right. To... And, and the first question always takes a little bit of time to... I'm going to use the... Actually, I'm going to maybe... I'm going to go open my window since now the sun's okay. gone, but the room's hot. Yeah. Um. So we will just give you a couple of minutes to ask the first question. Okay, hold on a second. Let me sure, come back. Sure. I, had to, I had to get up from, yeah. Oh. I'm gonna have this nice cool drink then. It's actually very watered down. No way I would be thinking this early. It's two hours earlier here. <laughs> okay. We will wait another couple of minutes and then we could. Oh, wait. Uh, I, got, I have a, a, a question from Ali Badar. Oh, okay. Um, should I read it out? Um, I think I see it. It's in the chat, right? Yes. Okay. So this is a question from Ali Badar and. Um, Great talk, Jenny. I was wondering what you think of the recent shift away from the post-colonial to world-lit and global Anglophone in recent times. So a shift away from yeah, post-colonial, world-lit, global Anglophone. I have huge problems with it um, because for a number of reasons. First of all, world-lit um, really reproduces the very kind of um, totalizing structure of both colonialism and now globalization, and the fact it's got world in there, um, that post-colonial studies really was very critical of. So, you know, um, people may have within post-colonial studies, and I'm gonna actually do that, those debates a little bit in the second half, were kind of taking, I mean, it, engaging in, well, when, you know, what, when did the post-colony start and where was the post-colony? And in our debates, we managed to 
tease apart settler colonialism from territorial colonialism, from uh, plantation colonialism. You know, we made all of these distinctions, each and each form having its own kind of um, particular relations to the seat of empire. When you kind of uh, replace it with world and global Anglophone, again, global uh, reproducing the structures of globalization, and I will. I will also be talking in the second half a little bit about uh, Spivak's notion of, of planetarity, you know, replacing the globe with the planet and what she means by that. But um, you, I have seen American lit thought as concluded, as, well, we've seen it mentioned as world lit. Global Anglophone, uh, it's British and global Anglophone. There's slippages, is it black British? And I know it's very hard to geographically locate things in these times when, um, you know, um, our cultures and peoples and stuff are moving. But I really do think the, the, kind, the structures of powers and the hierarchies that inform them disappear when you have something, you know, these unifying terms. Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen the effects of it in terms of um, the kind of scholarship that's been. Right. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. We have five. So let me, um, and this is coming in through the Q&A. So let me read out the first one from Enrique Olivares at UCLA. Do you perceive there to be fundamental differences between post-colonial studies and decolonial studies? I do. And that is my next section. So <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the next question from Akta Koshal. From the 80s and the times Spivak wrote her famous piece, how do you view the kind of explosion of post-colonial studies, theoretical formations and influences in a whole host of fields? Is there something missing in what it as a field has become and made of the original interventions today? Well, you know, uh, part of the reason I'm kind of, um, you know, giving the, presenting the field to you from this historical perspective that I have experienced, because it literally was from the beginning of my graduate school days until this moment that, um, that um, you have uh, described, um, I myself uh, ask, you know, how did we get here? And I think we can very much debate that, but I do think uh, there could be a number of reasons, but one of them very clearly is the waning of post-structural theory itself mm -hmm. and uh, the influence of post-structural theory in thinking on the field and also the field for that reason being highly the theoretical and theory itself moved in other directions, you know, and uh, particularly with things like affect and intimacies and some of the, uh, you know, the way the theory, theory shifted to other areas. And I think that had an effect on the field itself too. Um, next question, Jacqueline Barrios. I've always wanted a clarification regarding <laughs> Trayton and Dash Tellen. And it's important to Spivak's argument. Can Professor Sharp help pass this again? This is a, yeah. an interesting one. <laughs> so I should begin by saying is I do not know German. Okay, so, but um, so, uh, so I just have, uh, I have to take Spivak on, on faith, you know, in terms of what she says. But what she's trying to do is uh, we is try to um, distinguish between the two different ways we use represent, where like our um, our elected official represents us, right? They speak on our behalf, or the um, you know as an intellectual we are the proxy for whatever voice that we are representing, and I think she was taking offense with the idea, I think, of uh, Deleuze and Foucault, like uh, there is no more representation and she saw it as a kind of um, intellectual disavowal. Mm -hmm. Now that, uh, the second one, Dashten, is, is um, figure, she says figure, trope, but really it's all those literary elements mm -hmm. that Said uses to make his discourse analysis. 
and that is really at the center of um, post-colonial studies, uh, always unpacking the kind of either the history uh, to certain words. So like if uh, Spivak's even looking at sati and the way now we use sati for the widow and she's saying, no, that wasn't the case. She's unpacking the tropological formation of that very term, right? So that is um, a very different operation, you know, and uh, for her, as well as for Saeed, you know, they, they are always trying to foreground the, uh, the merits of one might call sort of uh, a literary approach to um, the world uh, rather than an empirical one, because the literary focuses much more on the actual forms of the representation itself. So that's what the second one is. So what um, Spivak is drawing attention to that when we fail to distinguish uh, if, uh, if I, you know, uh, between those two ways, it really allows then, this is where she's talking about the, the Indian um, women who uh, present themselves as being sort of, uh, you know, uh, wearing simple cotton and not being very bourgeois, if you want to call it, you know, and therefore they're down with the people and they are, and, and uh, they're one. So they're not seeing that separation um, in which takes place in the first one, the Bethrethi, uh, mm -hmm. that you are speaking on behalf. And if you're speaking on behalf, you are not them. You are, you are the whatever or the intellectual or the, uh, the bourgeois woman going in for general and development projects. She's very critical of um, sort of the, the women working on gender and development. And I, and I have an interview with her where she mentions, um, you know, um, asking someone who was working with um, subaltern women, you know, how's it going? And the person said, it's going well for the, for the, the gender and development people. <laughs> You know, I like, I don't know how well it's going for the women. And Spivak says, oh, that woman had her head on straight, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of, you know, kind of the, an awareness of the, um, you know, the difference there. So I don't know, um, Jackie, uh, Jacqueline, if that really answers, you know, it's just two different forms of representation and uh, um, not allowing the slippage between the two so that you, set, you, you end up identifying with um, mm -hmm. the person that you are speaking about. Thank you, that's wonderful. Um, the next question from Sambhavi Ghosh. If I were to think in biopolitical terms, could the subaltern be a homo sacco? I'm thinking in terms of caste and gender violence in India, as well as racial and communal discrimination globally. I know nothing about biopolitical terms or very little, you know, because that has become, I know, very popular. And um, it's, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not a path I pursue, you know, uh, necessarily. So sorry, mm -hmm. you're out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, last question from Amelia Reggie. If Orientalism requires a unification of that which is not Western, then why does Saeed argue that there is a connection between Orientalism and anti-Semitism? Isn't his discussion of the Holocaust a closer look at divisions within the West rather than between the West and outside of the West? So the, the, I mean, I can't get into the whole history of the Holocaust and the sort of Saeed's uh, position on it. I think Saeed would uh, in fact absolutely say there is a connection between Orientalism and anti-Semitism. I don't think he would deny that at all. If you look at, after all, there's the, both the Arab and Jew, the, uh, the, the uh, Semitics, I mean, the, the Semitics people. And so um, I, you know, a, a lot of what he um, is uh, probably objects to is some of the kind of, let's call it invention of tradition, you know? And um, the, the other, uh, the other uh, sort of 
critique, I guess, of his model of Orientalism is that, since you mentioned East and West, mm -hmm. is that it, you know, he says the Orientalism, um, the Orientalizing discourse makes this separation, complete separation between East and West. And there's a way in which that very binarism works in his analysis as well. Mm -hmm. And that has been since criticized and, you know, modified. And I don't think it discredits uh, the soundness of his argument necessarily. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we are done with this round. Um, mm. and okay. I will disappear and leave you to continue. Okay, so let me, um, let me make sure I have all my controls visible so I can get back in. Okay, so I hope my audience would agree after hearing my presentation of two of the founding texts of post-colonial studies that the term post refers to the aftermath of colonialism, but not its demise, as critics in the fields have indicated. Rather, post-colonial theory is an engagement with the remnants of what went before by both exposing colonial ways of knowing and showing their persistence, the Orientalism informing contemporary depictions of Arab and Islam and guiding US foreign policy. And to answer the other question, the, the, the US foreign policy sort of against Arab and, and Islam is very much determined by the, um, you know, existence of Israel, Israel as, an, as um, um, an ally. So some, that kind of common history itself becomes erased by the way the U.S. defines, you know, the peoples of Israel. The saving of third world women from their own men as the noble course for military intervention and gender and development pro uh, policy. This is in Spivak's work. There were heated and often contentious debates about the state of the field during the 90s. Queries into the beginnings of the post-colony, I mentioned some of that, and its diverse formations, the relationship of post-colonial studies to Commonwealth studies, the temporality of colonialism, debates captured by Arif Derelicks in famous response to the question, when exactly does the post-colonial begin? And his answer was with the arrival of third world intellectuals in the first world academy. I myself participated in these debates with two essays, is the United States post-colonial and post-colonial studies in the house of US multiculturalism, where I explain my own ability to disentangle a personal decision to pursue post-colonial studies from the institutional demand for diasporic third world scholars to teach the literatures of the former colonies. In terms of Saeed, Spivak's and Winter's generation, Dirlek's uh, statement is too easily dismissive of the fact that the presence of third world intellectuals in the US had as much to do with the waning of Europe's influence on its former colonies and the ascendancy of the US as a global power and the center of knowledge. A young woman from Chennai, formerly Madras, was admitted into a PhD program in 1958 at UC Berkeley, where she attended civil rights demonstration at which she met a graduate stu student from Jamaica. You probably recognize this as um, the story of Kamala ha Harris, her parentage, whose identity as a descendant of Caribbean slaves and the U US born child of a South Indian and Jamaican immigrant can be read as an allegory for how the history of the US as a white settler colony involving the theft of land from indigenous peoples and transport of cost effective labor from Africa and Asia intersects with European colonialism. They are the interconnected colonial relationships Lisa Lowe describes in her book, The Intimacies of Four Continents. In terms of post-colonial theory, perhaps the auto critiques and critiques upon critiques painted the field into a corner. Perhaps its influence extended so far into other fields, post-colonial studies itself did not enjoy the prominence it once had. The title of a uh, 2007 issue of PMLA, The End of Post-Colonial Theory, while posed as a question, explores the sentiment of whether the post-colonial moment in academia had run its course. And I think this was the question that was asked earlier. Since that time, I've noticed an increasing popularity of decolonial over post-colonial as preferred uh, term. And uh, that is the other question. So I will now go to my share screen. 
here and play. Okay. Decolonial was introduced as an alternative to post-colonial by Walter Mignolo through the demand that we delink from Western epistemologies, which includes post-structuralism and deconstruction. Some of what he says, like unveil unveiling the imperial presuppositions that maintain a universal idea of humanity informing human rights, has already been undertaken by post-colonial st uh, studies. And Spivak has an essay called Writing Wrongs, I mean, and there are many others. However, the decolonial shift he uh, proposes involves a complete delinking from the logic of Western philosophies, which places the intellectual in a more oppositional position than Said, who promotes secular humanism of, of, of a worldly kind. I think it's a little bit uh, different than simple liberal humanism. And Spivak, who identifies intellectual complicity where we would want to shore up oppositions. And that's her deconstructionist position. Spivak's writings are critical of a universal human being, but being a deconstructionist, she does not posit an outside to the rules of the game, to use uh, Bignolo's terms, since no part of the world has been untouched by colonialism and now globalization. Yet, as Berlu indicates at the end of her essay, and that's uh, the assigned um, recommended reading, and I assigned her essay, she's a historian, but I think she does a really great reading uh, of Spivak and how, you know, and how she informs um, his story. So read it, do read it. I think it's a great essay. Sp um, Spivak has moved from the mechanics of othering to the possibilities of alterity that require the work of the imagination while resisting the will to knowledge. Okay, so this is, this is real, very important uh, to Spivak, that the will to knowledge, to what degree, even by following the de decolonial path, are we pursuing that will to knowledge that is part of the colonial project, right? Spivak's concept metaphor of the planet involves seeing our world not from the totalizing perspective of the globe, which he says exists in our computer, world wide web, world literature, global anglophone, <laughs> You, you, you can keep going <laughs> and, inf and informs globalization or the sanctioned ignorance of the colonizing classes, okay? So there's a weird kind of doubleness to the uh, universalizing of um, Western forms of knowledge, both through a very kind of totalizing perspective, but one that, it, that allows ignorance to be sanctioned. She calls it sanctioned, but ignorance to count as knowledge. Okay, her position is in fact, is to maintain the unknowable as the planet might appear to an alien. Like, you know, let's just uh, resist the lure of the will to know. I see Spivak's idea of planetarity as offering an ethics of reading that alerts us to the lure of making the same totalizing and universalizing moves we seek to escape. Um, and she's very conscious that we operate in institutions and institutions inform how we operate, you know, even when we think they don't. So largely it's that sort of um, breaking the house down from the inside, which is of course very different from what <laughs> uh, Audre Lorde said, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house, but there you have it. Um, so my own position is that while non-Western epistemologies have been violently transformed or even destroyed by the global spread of Western culture, it is possible to see how their non-conformity to Western systems of meaning is not the same as its deconstruction. So in some ways, I just, I don't think that those, um, you know, other non-Western epistemologies have to be uh, made to conform to a deconstruction of a Western binary system, because then again, we're forcing it into the binary system that we seek to escape. I unpacked the complexities of this difference in my new book, Immaterial Archives. But for now, I want to follow the thread of Vignolo's argument, because I think this is important, uh, mentioned only parenthetically in the passage I just read. I mean, guess the term from Ngugi. 
and, uh, in a, and, and that it, what Ngugi was doing was mentioning decolonizing the mind is a very specific moment of the post-colony and from a very specific culture, which is his own, the Gikuyu, who are a minority culture in uh, Kenya. Ngugi called for decolonizing the mind when he saw the failure of post-colonial nations to break with colonial hierarchies. He argued that the colonizer's suppression of one's mother tongue, as indeed was the case for him, when, a school, when as a school child he was caned and made to wear a sign that said, I am stupid for speaking Gikuyu, resulted in self-alienation. This is why he insisted on the necessity for written literature in African languages, which at the time did not have written script. Uh, Kamu Brathway, writing from the Caribbean during the 70s, made a similar appeal for patois or what he called nation language. As is explained on the slide, Devil on the Cross was the first novel Ngugi wrote in his native language on government issued toilet paper while in prison. And all of his subsequent novels have been in Gukuyu as well. There's undoubtedly an allegory to be derived from how the first written work of fiction in Gukuyu came into being. Uh, but the story I want to recount is the one that has become legendary. 10 years after Ngui's arrest, the Moi regime being threatened by reports of a man by the name of Matagari inciting the Kenyan people to revolt issued a warrant for his arrest. When it was discovered that this Matagari, meaning, quote, the patriots who survived the bullets, end of quote, was the fictional hero of Ngugi's 1986 novel of the same name, orders were given to confiscate all copies and disappear the book. If there was ever a story about the influence of literature on real life events, it would be this one. When extending Ngugi's delinking from the English language to the Western Academy, Academy, it is important to remember that he is, to use Gramsci's term, an organic intellectual. As one, this is Gramsci's description, as one who makes, quote, I'm quoting from Gramsci now, coherent the principles and the problems raised by the masses in their practical activity. Gramsci introduced subaltern, a military term for the foot soldiers who marched at the rear of a battalion for designating both subordinate classes and subordinated forms of knowledge in order to overturn the Marxist idea of intellectuals being at the vanguard of revolutions. Subaltern or subordinate knowledges are composed not only of philosophies that have been assigned a non-disruptive place, but also those that are unrecognizable according to institutionalized systems of meaning. So this is, I think, where the sort of um, the decolonial idea can be useful. You know, this sort of trying to break through certain frames of reference that we have, which allow us to see or not see um, certain uh, forms of meaning. And I will be getting to that when I get to uh, Sylvia Winter. So here's what Gramsci says. I mean, but of course he was writing um, at a different moment in time, but still, you know, he says, even though subaltern groups think according to the terms of hegemonic discourse, and he's writing about Southern Italy, their philosophy manifests itself in the contradiction between thought and action. Rather than being at the forefront of social change, academic knowledge, knowledge lags behind. Again, this is all what Gramsci is saying, which is why he insists that theory not be separated from politics which is the topic of my concluding section. So the third scholar I've selected for this lecture is Sylvia Winter, who has been considered more of a black study scholar than a post-colonial one, but who like Stuart Hall is Jamaican and hence brings to the fore the intersection of post-colonial and critical race theory in black British and Caribbean studies. And uh, this is the first entry in the, in the section of key concepts that I gave you. Winter, who was already an established author and playwright and scholar of Hispanic literature at UE's Mona campus, was invited by the uh, University of California in San Diego to direct a program in third world literature in 1974. In her theoretical writings, Winter picks up Fanon's call for a new humanism. The signed essay was originally published in 1995, which was around the time Haitian asylum seekers were refused sanctuary in the US and it is the crisis of the Caribbean to which she alludes in her opening uh, paragraphs. And these two um, uh, paragraphs are from the first two pages. I couldn't really get the page numbers on it. It's the first two pages. 
Winter contextualizes this moment with the early 20th century US military occupation of Haiti and the subsequent Duvalier dictatorship. She also discusses voodoo as both the African derived religion of the people and the means by which Papa Doc Duvalier created a black identified populist platform against the westernized mixed race class. These are some of the contradictions of post-colonial nations that confound the binary opposition of colonize the colonized or, or West and the rest or you know, whichever way you want to slice it, North, South. Is Duvalier engaging in decolonial thinking because he rejects Western definitions of man or is he being imperialist because uh, he is occupying the place of the French uh, colonizers? While expressing an awareness of these contradictions, Winter addresses the overrepresentation of man to the exclusion of other definitions of the human and how we might rethink the fullness of human ontologies through heterogeneous ways of knowing. And she kind of introduces it through this frame, um, which is a, a reading of um, the earliest moment of the European conquest of the Americas and therefore the one least likely to have archival records, particularly since as Anne Stoller talks about in her introduction to on the, along the archival brain in just a little footnote that in the case of um, you know, um, the, Amer uh, the American continent in Mexico, the Aztec, um, all of the records were burned by the Spaniards, very little survived. So, um, they explicitly destroyed any form of access outside of, of course, um, oral memory, which is what she deals with when she's talking about Haiti. Um, I assign the reading not only because I love the title, but also because it demonstrates the possibility for identifying fissures within the colonial archives. In this instance, the highly mediated record of an indigenous response to a colonizing world view. I mean, this is highly media, we do, do not get the actual speech and who knows what they actually said in terms of language and all of that. Um, the response of the 16th century Senu people to the Spanish requisition, a, a juridical document legitimated by the papal bull of 1493, granting the new world to Spain, localizes a, a perspective that discursively positions itself as universal. Once we see this presumably universal worldview as being restricted to Europe alone, then the absurdity of, or presumed absurdity of the sinew statement as reported in the archives begins to dissolve. The quotation in the slides are from the first, uh, I already said first two pages, uh, which stage the conflicting interpretive systems in the contact zone. From the perspective of the Senu, the requisition's declaration of ownership for the King of Spain is beyond comprehension. The Judeo-Christian narrative of divine prophecy, on the other hand, normalizes colonization to such a degree that Senu resistance licenses the King of Spain to seize their land and enslave them. So do you see how this is tautological? I mean, you either accept it and, it, and you know, because it is, but if you resist it, then that is proof that in fact you should be colonized and enslaved. In order to break the tautological and totalizing vision of the requisition, Winter suggests that we treat Latin Christian Europe as a local culture. This approximates uh, Chakravorty's call for us to provincialize secular human time, except that she prefers to call secular a de-godding in order to expose the Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo sacred narratives embedded within it. The remain, and you, in fact, these, these, um, the embeddedness of these, of, um, these uh, Judeo-Christian uh, uh, perspective exists even in the secular view, um, and particularly our viewing of earth from the heavens, right? We see it from the heavens looking down. That's very uh, Judeo-Christian. And um, in my chapter on uh, voodoo, I, I talk about how within that epistemology, actually you are in the waters uh, looking up. So it's a different perspective of the world. Um, so the remainder of the essay, of her essay, connects past to present, but not by showing how 20th century human agency 
in the former colonies overturns the totalizing discourse of the past, but rather how the clash of worldviews that we see in the Senu Spanish exchange continues into the modern era. The title of this section, Two Understandings of Humanity, Two Modes of Reflective Thought, The Neo Agrarian World of Voodoo, The Techno Industrial World of the West, alludes to the clash of worldviews at the time of the US occupation of Haiti in 1915. After the U.S. Marines killed Charmé Perrault, who led the Haitian resistance against the invasion, they stripped and tied his body to a door with a Haitian flag draped behind him as a statement about the defeat of Haitian resistance. One of the Marines took a photograph that was reproduced and dropped from airplanes across the island for demoralizing the Haitian people. And in fact, um, the same psychological operations were used as recent as uh, 1983 in Grenada after the fall of the People's Revolutionary Government, uh, which uh, allowed then for the US to invade. So this is ongoing. Instead, Haitian people who viewed the image th um, through the iconography of Voodoo saw in the Christ-like figure a martyr who inspired and empowered them. There was a long history of Haitian slaves and peasants investing Christian icons and images with the sacred symbolism of voodoo and peasants investing, um, and it, yeah, so, um, and because you may say, well, this is Christian, but it's not quite Christian. Um, in this instance, the image uh, designed to de dehumanize Perot by making him appear abject had the opposite effect within the signifying system of voodoo, which is a religion that appears as superstitious and even demonic within the codes of a Judeo-Christian secular frame. Winter concludes by calling on us to view the history of humanity from the outsider vantage point of the 16th century Senu people. And this is the way she ends the essay. She says, human beings are magical, bios and logos, words made flesh, muscle and bone, animated by hope and desire, belief, materializing deeds, deeds which crystallize our actualities. It is man who brings society into being. She quotes Fanon, and this is why, I mean, she does both explicitly and less explicitly build on his project. And the maps of spring always have to be redrawn again in undead forms. Despite the Caribbean islands being condemned to a quote, waste paper existence, which is an expression Winter derives from Césaire's notebook of a return to my native land, she ends with the anti-secular assertion of human beings as magical. Alluding to the teachings of C.L.R. James and Fanon, she asserts how bodies are animated into action by hope and desire. At the same time, the last sentence suggests how our photographies of hope and desire have to be continuously redrawn, redrawn and reimagined. And I do think that this um, kind of, if we see how it intersects with both Spivak and Said in terms of, uh, you know, talking about the place of the imagination um, in breaking the kinds of systems mean, of meaning that they seek to do so. Winter is not only saying that we need to imagine possible worlds that have not yet come into being, but also view the past through a perspective akin to the Senu, who saw a world changing document like the Papal Bull of 1493 as having been penned by a drunkard at the request of a madman. Thank you, I think is my next slide and I'm done. <laughs> Hello, back. Okay, we're ready for some more Q and A. Yes. Um, so um, now that we're at the end of the lecture, um, please sort of type in, use a Q&A to just type in your questions. Um, and I think some of what you were talking about um, very nicely kind of answered questions that came up in the first section. Well, now, I'm glad they anticipated me. <laughs> yeah. So they will, you know, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think the decolonial post-colonial is resolved in any way, shape or form. I think again, uh, to follow uh, Guha, uh, 
you have to do that judicious reading, mm -hmm. figure out, you know, put the, the various kinds of um, arguments besides each other and kind of decide yourself. Um, um, we actually have somebody who raised their hands and so I'm going to ask that person to speak. Um, let me see. And um, I just, just one thing, I just saw King Kok Chiang, my colleague at UCLA, okay. wants to raise a toast to Susan Koshi, her <laughs> postdoctoral student at UCLA. <laughs> see, you, see you, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, I'm trying to make this work. Uh, let's see. Anon okay. Co options. Um, can you give me an example? Okay. Okay. So, um, so for the person who just raised their hand, could yes. you, uh, Isi Neyman Ihien, could you please just enter your question into the Q and A tab? Just uh, click on the tab, and then that will allow you to write in your question, and that way we can get it. Um, so let. In the meantime, <laughs> there is another question. Um, what about co-optations of post-colonial and decolonial discourse? Are you wary of this? I, yeah. I want to know what is meant by and what mm. co -op, uh, I'm not quite sure by whom, where, I mean, in what way. Um, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I'm wary of everything, you know, and um, I was, uh, you know, kind of um, taught to always question, you know, so I, and, and, and really the, the truth of the matter is that um, we, we um, you know, the best intellectual inquiry takes place in conversation with others, even dissenting positions perhaps, um, and uh, rather than accepting certain kinds of theories as dogma, I mean, having it become dogma. I think it's always good to always go back and question why um, something is, why are you holding on to this? And if you can answer that question, or why should you, is there a necessity to let go of that? Or, you know, um, I think um, you, oh, oh, what is that lure? You know, what is the desire? I think for Spivak also, it's always, what is the desire that is driving a particular kind of um, investigation? And I think if it's a desire, what she was addressing at the time of Can the Subleton Speak was all those, um, all of those uh, feminist uh, books that came out, Third World Women Speak, I don't even, African Women Speak, South Asian, you know, they, all those books were coming out. And, um, you know, she's just sort of trying to say, okay, so why is this being mm -hmm. offered at this particular moment of time? And in looking at the colonial officials, what they're trying to do is get the, the, the sati, you know, the, the widow, to speak, to say, no, I don't want to burn. <laughs> you know, there's a kind of impulse there. So that's all. I mean, then just to um, sort of question it, you know. So let me see. Okay, next question. Um, do you think secular humanism can be genuinely localized or are dangerous claims to universality inherent in its composition? Well, of course it's inherent. Yes, I think... <laughs> I think, uh, of course, it's completely inherent in its composition. Um, I, you know, when I said secular, I said worldly, which was Saeed's version of it, which he was already uh, unpacking some of those claims to universality. I mean, if you, um, if you read the first chapter of my Allegories of Empire, I answer the question, uh, I begin with the question of uh, that, um, uh, why at the moment of the abolition of slavery mm -hmm. do we see the consolidation and the emergence of racial discourses, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really has to do with the, the, the sort of French Revolution, the American Revolution, these kinds of um, 
uh, declarations of equality and, you know, through a sort of liberal humanism and uh, that then has to be qualified, right? I mean, it has to be then policed the boundaries and you then have simultaneous with, um, with these declaration of universal humanity, the colonizing, civilizing mission, the racialized, I mean, those, those eugenic think books have been around the whole 18th century. I mean, they just, but they become activated with the ab abolition of slavery because now you need a different form of bondage, you know, um, not to, since you don't have the physical. So yeah, so I think they are, they are definitely um, um, danger, dangerous. I think the idea of, um, I mean, if you say that should we abandon in, you know, should we abandon some of the, um, the um, uh, forms that we have inherited, like rational thought and all that kind of, I mean, we do it every day. I mean, we're in an academy where we have to make an argument, an academic argument. I mean, people, I know there were a lot of people who are, um, you know, uh, doing different kinds of writing, free flowing, you know, um, and, but, um, it's, um, you know, it, it, not everybody does it well. <laughs> I mean, some, I, uh, that's all. I mean, it's, it's because when you're trying to, kind of, you know, it's all like when I was a graduate student, we saw Oriental and go, I want to write that book, you know, of course, none of us wrote that book. But, <laughs> but anyway, so there is, I mean, I think definitely the move is to, is to actually transform the very mode of academic writing itself. And that's good. I think that's a good, a good enterprise. Um, but I, you know, at the same time, we shouldn't pretend as if we don't rely on um, some of the, um, let me go see, the Saeed, that quote I gave where he talks about, you know, rational interpretive systems, the legacy of a humanistic education. Mm -hmm. And then he also talks about, uh, you know, sort of, um, um, a perception modes of understanding and things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, even as he is tracing the incredible violence being done uh, by those very same modes of understanding. So, let me see, there are a bunch of questions here. Okay, two more. Uh, Safura Arbab, mm -hmm. are there parallels between decolonial and feminist theories? And do they intersect in positing alternate frameworks of knowledge as a form of resistance against Western or dominant epistemology? Yeah, I mean, definitely, um, I, you do see that with a lot of the um, um, Chicana writing that came out, for instance, um, in the 80s at the time, being critical of actually Western feminism was very much embracing the kind of decolonial perspective. And um, I, you know, I don't, this is why I drew attention to, um, um, you know, Gloria and Azura comes to mind, for instance, in terms of borderlands, but this is why I drew attention to Nguli uh, as someone who introduced the term as being an organic and intellectual, uh, even though he's in a university now and he has been in exile for a long time, but when he was writing that, those, um, you know, talking about decolonizing the mind, um, and uh, he was very much um, connected organically to the community about which he was writing. And I think a lot of uh, feminists of color see themselves in that way, you know, and probably maybe you yourself work on, on uh, women in, I know your pro project among your dissertation committee, but you know, yeah. Alexis Webb. Alexis Webb, do you believe the process of othering has been replaced in modern colonization with the desire for forceful unification by replacing what makes someone other with the identity of the imposing group. I'm thinking specifically of things like problematic culture of mission trips. I, what's the cult culture of mission trips? Um, I'm not familiar with that. So, I don't know. Is, is, oh. this, is this a, a question about Othering in the context of conversion and assimilation? Um, By replacing with someone other, the desire for forceful unification, by replacing with, and I, with identity of the imposing. I mean, 
you know, let me, you say mission in there. So I'll go back to, you know, the civilizing mission, which was, I mean, um, a, 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 a job, I mean, a, a project, and we talk about Macaulay's minute, infamous minute on Indian education, where, you know, the Indians would be, um, you know, um, English and taste, culture, you know, everything except blood. <laughs> Okay, so there you go. So they are trying to force them uh, to assume the identity of the imposing group, but there will always be that level of inferiority, right? Because you don't, you know, the racial component. So um, I don't know if that's the same as what you're talking about, but um, that is an old kind of colonial, um, um, modern colonial, 19th century colonial, not if you, the, the early Spanish was genocide, right? Uh, or, um, you know, um, the, or conversion, uh, Christian conversion, genocide, these are the, the but, but when you get to the, um, the 19th century, uh, it's much more through, you're trying to really uh, produce the colonial subject or what was even known as the WAG, Western Orientalized, oh, Gentleman. Orientalized Oriental gentlemen, right? I mean, yeah. Um, that, well, I lost sight. I've got, I'm looking at this slide. Let me find the picture again. Yeah. So the idea is that you were, in fact, uh, producing yourself and the other, even as they remain other. <laughs> mm -hmm. That both affirms the superiority. I mean, that's the decolon, I mean, that's what Engelby is talking about decolonizing the mind, and it exists until today. Um, you know, uh, Jemima Pierre, who's uh, in anthropology at UCLA, has a whole book on, on how uh, Ghana, the, the, um, how much Ghanaians have been internalized whiteness that, you know, people in um, Africans, African Americans you know, in the diaspora sort of see an absence of, of alienation in Africa itself, because you never were taken from the homeland, but she shows how, in fact, you know, that alienation uh, exist there too because they were colonized. I mean, Ghana was a British colony. So, so this is why you have to see. I mean, I think that the the I talk about I'm not, one of the gifts of uh, post-colonial theory I should have mentioned is to see that interconnectedness. You know, I mean, which I've tried to draw attention to when I'm always talking about uh, one thing. So if I'm talking about Black Lives Matter as well, what about what else is happening on our borders? what is happening in the Caribbean, what's happening, you know, let's say what's happening in Iraq. I mean, our militarization here, I mean, we have now been involved in, in the war in Iraq longer than Vietnam. And, can, and no one thinks that has nothing to do with the militarization of our police and our culture here. Um, it's, um, it does, you know, we, as much as Trump would like to think America first, <laughs> It's not, we're not disconnected from the rest of the world. I mean, so. no open questions, okay. I think, yes, I think those are all the questions we have. Okay, well, I don't wanna end with mentioning Trump's name. So I will just want to thank everybody for coming just to see uh, if there's anything I have missed in the comments from all places. So one, uh, Blair Winter is from Mexico that was left out of the countries. And um, um, yeah, so it's been great. I wish I could see, I wish I could be able to see all of your faces, but uh, thank you so much for coming and engaging.